Good morning, everybody. Uh, big <coughs> the big decision of today was whether to wear a tie or not. <laughs> and I was going to do a head count. And I think I'm probably close to the oldest person in the room, old school. Um, but the bigger decisions in our business are about Brexit. As a business, we are a national supplier of temporary and permanent recruitment services. And we supply CML in their operation in Lutterworth with many hundreds of uh, EU-based labour. Uh, we recruit locally and we service them in a traditional uh, recruitment agency fashion. Um, for the last 18 months or so, I've been surveying the market um, and today is Halloween. They brought me out to horrify everybody and I've got some stats that might do that. But don't be disheartened by this information that I give you. Uh, I am working and my team are working and Adam, one of our other directors, is working even harder than me at providing solutions which put us to the head of the market, taking the challenges head on and coming up with sensible commercial answers. So I'll take you through in a fairly rapid 25 slide, a record breaking 25 slide presentation. So it's going to be fast. Don't stop me. I've got to get sat down again quickly. <laughs> OK, so what's the news? Well, we all know the news. We're going to leave with a deal. We're going to leave without a deal. We're going to hold a new people's vote. The ONS, the Office of National T Statistics, who are head of the biggest lie department in, in the world, because we all know this damn lies on statistics. Um, they've got four, ba four case scenarios. The base case, which is basically where we are, which is a net migration of 335,000 down to 185,000. Fantastic. Well, that's already killing the market as it is. And if it wasn't for the decline in what Amelia was saying earlier in the automotive markets and the retail markets, we've been in a worse situation than we are now. So there are natural elements on top of Brexit that are impacting upon our performance. So the base case is where we are now. The government then have done a calculation based upon the 100,000 100, uh, net migration figure, a 40,000 net migration figure, and a great EU re-migration. And all this is available on the ONS website. And basically, they pr produce a graph. The graph basically says uh, 48 to 49% of the people are working, and the rest are children, non-working, unemployable, etc., and uh, retired. Um, the only thing I can gather from that chart is that we need to widen, as employers, our scope. So look at, for example, at B&Q. You go in B&Q, you see the older guy, lo looks a bit like me, with a T-shirt on, he gets the, the saw, he helps you, and it's a great purchasing experience. That guy was probably going to be sat on his backside for five, ten years, but now he's employed. So op instead of saying, I want two girls for employment tomorrow, uh, they've got to be 35 to 40 years old because the nimble fingered packers like in the good old days. I mean, it wasn't even that way when I was a kid. So this reality of widening the employment opportunity to what younger people and training them and old people and training them, people have got to start thinking outside the box. So what's happening with the market for recruiters? Well, there's a reduction in candidate flow. We see it now. Our offices are still full of people wanting jobs. But there's 10 people coming in and only two people speak in English at the moment. And they're coming from all over the world. Competition for candidates. I remember before the EU staff came over and the amount of cost and energy we had to uh, put into place to attract candidates. We're getting towards that place now. Inflation on pay rates. I'm going to show you a pay rate scale later on. Um, we've noticed there's a th even in a 50 mile radius of this uh, hotel, there's a 30% variation on the pay rates from minimum pay upward <coughs> on depending on who the employer is for basically the same jobs. So 30%, just think about that. It's a candidate driven market, that means people are going to leave and it's going to mean that when people are coming into work with language issues, there's an increased administration and welfare responsibilities upon the employers. A uh, quick survey, which is a bit of a shocker on, on for us internally, 69% of our workers who we employ at the moment are from the EU. 69%, hell of a hell of a percentage. I was thinking 45, 47. We did the stats last week on the payroll, bang, 69. Thanks very much. So what we've got to do is we've got to keep them, and our strategy is to climb higher than our competition. I, I've looked at our competition, I interview people from our competition all the time. I can assure you they haven't got it sorted. So Mac Recruitment is saying, right, win new work, 
put new, new systems, new pay rates into place, make people link their pay to productivity and get ahead of the productivity pay gap. Um, back over to Brussels. What are the trends? So a 20% reduction in EU candidates is what we've measured this year so far. 24% increase in advertising cost. And that is a lot of money in a business like us on a monthly basis. It's going to affect the margins that we have to charge and the cost that we incur. 30% in increase in training cost, and that's impacting on, upon our customers. So our customers are having to spend more money on replacing people who are leaving the, the average tenure is halving, and that's having that impact upon training costs. And the productivity gap, uh, most of our customers measure over a 12-week period. Some, some cut it short as low as six weeks. But replacing a person in a job costs somewhere between £600 if you're, if, if, if you're fairly low-skilled and well over a 1000 I've got some stats on how that grows through Brexit later on. Um, and the average la lever rate has increased by 11% this year. So we're re replacing more bookings with more people, some more levers. The landscape on visas is, is very complicated, but the uh, government website says that uh, you, they can tell you anything you need to know from March 2019 to 2021. I looked at it and I, I was clueless when I came out of it. Um, but basically, the simple answers are that they've got a, if you've got five years residency already, then you'll automatically be able to stay. Anybody coming in before 2019, March 29th, my birthday, uh, is actually going to have to apply, but will be able to stay. And uh, if they are under 30, they can get a two-year Tier 5 exemption. But otherwise, um, it's going to be difficult. So visas are going to be a problem. So predictions for next year will be a 26% reduction in the EU workforce, a 40% increase in advertising costs. Now, people like Indeed, who you see on TV all the time advertising and everybody who's on a little bus, who wants a job, who's on the way home, is on Indeed app. Um, we use it all the time. It has a lot of free services. They are stealthily increasing their rates by the day. Every week they've got a new programme. It always costs a little bit more somewhere. So anything they gave for free before is now a premium service. So, and, and they are commanding some massive increases and they're happy about it. Uh, and as a worldwide company, they do it, they've done it in other countries and they're, and they're doing it in the UK now. They've really got a grip of the market and we've noticed massive increases in our budgets this year, ready for next year. Uh, again, another 30% increase on the training cost next year on top of this year. So that's not 30%, thank you very much. It's 30% on top of 30%. And attrition rates, again, an additional 15%. A lot of work being created by Brexit, some of it unnecessarily and some is just natural change. The workers, what do they want? When they come into the office and say, what do you want? What do you need? They want an opportunity to improve. People have come to the UK to work to improve. The UK people, there's apprenticeships available to people. There's training schemes all over the place. There's more money being thrown at training than anything else in the recruitment market. Getting hold of it and keeping the worker tied down to it is the most difficult thing. However, it still is there if you care to apply for it. People don't like to be excluded, so culturally inclusive environments. I've been to uh, factories and warehouses in the last six months, and I still see old practices. Segregation of workforce, no signs in different languages, no inclusion uh, uh, strategies whatsoever. Those customers are going to suffer. They have to grow and you have to invest. It's not, you can't stand still. Regularity of work. People want to know they've got a job, just like you do. All the workers that work in the recruitment agencies are just like you. They all want the maximum yield for the hours that they actually are coming to work for. No different. What do we need to do to improve attraction and retention? You need to link pay to output. So if people work harder, they're going to get paid more. Then they will stay longer. You need to promote from within. Have supervisors from all the different cultural areas. Improve the super supervisory skills, which I think is the big one, because a good supervisor will promote from within and will have a better productivity. Work on communication. We have a, uh, a mobile recruitment office, and it, it, it is often full of pop crisps, water and, and, and freebies. And that's about having workshops with people, listening to people's feedback on whether it's good to work on a certain factory floor or not, but basically having the communication two-way, not one-way. And training staff continuously, which is something that everybody knows, pays off. Free tips, no charge.
Swedish derogation, something that if you're a large scale employee, you'll, you'll be aware of. That's paying different rates to, to temporary workers than you pay to your permanent workers. 90% of the people that we're talking to and beyond are at pay parity. So if you pay a permanent worker, you pay a temporary worker the same rate of pay. There's a lot of work in the background to make sure that, that works in your favour. But some companies still, the large food suppliers, uh, the large food customers are still having a Swedish derogation style model and that's abusing the worker. We've been tracking wages on Amazon, Sainsbury's and Tesco. They're the three market leaders of uh, distribution companies and I've got a pay scale for you in a second. If, you, if, you, if your companies and uh, employers are in remote locations, put, put a bus on from the city centre. Make it as easy for people to get to work. People can't afford cars anymore. Put a bus on, have it subsidised. We're doing that on certain factories and warehouses at the moment. It works very well. It, it keeps people coming back to you all the time. Make it easy for people to come to work for you. And planning with strategic suppliers. Sit down and have a conversation with your, with your supplier about the problems. Discuss it. Don't penalise them. Don't say what are the answers. Plan it. Just discuss it. Talk about it and talk about it a lot. And work on feedback from colleagues. Have a happy face, smiley face type approach like you do in a hotel or in a washroom in the services I saw last week. Unfortunately, it was uh, green or red and I wanted to go for brown, but th that was a different story. Um, these are the pay scales. I hope you can see this. Uh, Amazon recently increased their pay rates at 9.50 from a 7.83, eight pound style. That was nationally. And in London, they increased it to 10.50. Bold moves, market leading always pushing to the front. Obviously, they've got a bad reputation in a lot of their warehouses, so they have to do that sometimes. Uh, we've just picked up a job for Sainsbury's at £11.20 an hour for manual labour, uh, and that's working in a freezer warehouse. Nothing specifically highly skilled. They just want somebody with arms and legs who can got a bit of muscle and a bit of brain who wants to do that on a long-term basis. But if you think about it, people talk about minimum pay at £7.83, rising to £8.21 in April, according to the budget. They're paying £11.20 now. Um, <coughs> nine pound an hour at rugby is standard and has been standard for a while. Tesco are paying nine fifty and eleven twenty one for nights in Devonshire and Hinckley. So within a small radius of where we are today, you can see the variation. It's massive. It's a massive variation. Just on this basically the same worker could get a job at any one of those places for those rates. So it's going to cause havoc if the pay rates are low. This is an estimate based upon last track in the last few years and then projecting that going forward. It basically says that in 2016, the average replacement cost of a worker who leaves and gets another job on a low skilled job is 880 pound. That's the cost to a business. And we're predicting that by 2020, that's gonna be 1500 pound. Now that's a 30% increase of where we are in the next two years. So when you're pricing your projects, Think about the labour cost. It's one of the top three items in any costing schedule, but it's going to go up. The training cost is going to go up. 69% of people stay with the company if they experience great onboarding. And we were talking to Yvonne earlier, nodding Yvonne, thank you. <laughs> talking to Yvonne earlier, and she was, she, was, she, she, went, she was saying, oh, we're doing this, we're doing this. I'm just crossing out my presentation, and just spoiling all my thunder here. Great onboarding. She said that she's uh, improved the website experience and the linking of all the technology, which is available to you now through to the application. If you can get all of that fluid and working in your benefit, you'll get the labour. Because people don't want to hang on the phone. They don't want to go on another website. They don't want to send a CV. They want to link it through immediately as they do it. They want to do it bang, bang, bang from an app straight into your HR department. And, and when it goes through to the HR department, they want an answer quick. They want an interview straight away. They want the feedback straight away. That's the biggest problem that I personally face in my daily job is feedback. I've got to get a, a guy in front of a, an interview and I've got to get an answer on it quickly. If it takes more than a week, I'm having the chance of success already. So speed of communication is crucial. And finally, that was a picture of our, I'll go back on that one, I like that one. That's our van. Uh, and that's our basically taking the jobs to the people. We're, we've got a warehouse in Hull, that's in Hull centre and uh, candidate uh, uh, traffic is very low so we just get the van take it to the centre put some pop crisps outside balloons bang get your candidates flowing through it works really well 
Uh, we've now gone and opened an office in Poland three months ago and one two months ago in Bulgaria. So we're still bringing in large numbers of people. And we're actually then getting bookings in Poland for Polish labour, which we're bringing back from the UK to work in Poland for the same customers that are in England. So uh, it's working really well in terms of a concept. Um, I guess when uh, Brexit comes in, there's going to be some challenges to that. And that's one of our biggest challenges is how we continue to recruit in those countries under licence possibly upskilling over there and then bringing people over trained. So specific client strategies, long-term contracts tied into certain skill levels. Um, and then our expansion um, and our challenge and our strategy is about hitting the market hard, making sure we're covering the areas. And we've just opened two offices in the London area, Charlton and Dartford, but all the other areas are recruitment hubs. So basically we're covering the whole UK and we cover the map as such with our customers. So we've got 19 sites in the... Yorkshire area and, and South Yorkshire um, Midlands, five sites in the East Midlands in this area, three in the Kent London area, three in the South Midlands, two in the South, five in the North West and three in the North East and Scotland. Um, so as a business, we're a family business with a turnover of about £90 million. Uh, we were at £25 million three years ago. We're taking the opportunity to grow. We're seeing this as an opportunity, not a problem. So we're getting off our backsides and hitting the market hard. That was us navigating Europe, by the way. Okay, thank you for your time.